Very good, very good. So the question is, as you may have seen our guests, many of the Muslim ladies, almost all of them, they are wearing some covering. And the brother is asking, is that covering the hijab, is that a symbol of oppression or is it a symbol of freedom and empowerment? So hijab, you know, just like there is a dress code anywhere that we go. Our brothers over here, they are wearing a dress code, right? That's the dress code that is expected of them. If I am working in the hospital, there's a dress code. When people go to any schools and colleges, there is a dress code. So the dress code that our Creator has given for humanity is the dress code of modesty. And the hijab reflects that modesty, right? Number one. Number two, it's not forced on any person. They are, they are wearing because God has commanded them to wear. Number three thing is, uh, what we wear is not the only aspect of modesty. Modesty in Islam is a holistic concept. That means modesty of my eyes and your eyes. The Quran says in chapter 24, verse number 30, that oh you believing males, lower your gaze and guard your modesty. It is better for you in the eyes of God. And the same injunction is given to the ladies in the next uh, sentence. So modesty of the eyes is also important. Modesty of the tongue. You know, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that say something good or remain silent. Right? That's modesty of the tongue. And I always say that, you know, how many marriages can be saved if husband and wife abide with that. Right? Come on. And how many worlds, calamities can be prevented if we abide by always doing good and saying good. So hijab is a holistic concept. But the concept of modesty is not only in Islam, it is also found in the Jewish faith. Our Jewish sisters, once they get married, they have to cover their hair, they cannot show their hair. Mother Mary, right? Mary the mother of Jesus, she used to also adhere to the concept of hijab. If you see any depiction of Mary the mother of Jesus, she's fully covered herself as a pious and cherished and an honored sister, yes. Our Christian sisters who are here, especially when they go to church, they are supposed to also wear the hijab when they are in the church. Who is saying this? Not me. The Bible is saying this. In the New Testament, in the first book of Corinthians, chapter number 11, verse number 5 and 6. So hijab is a concept of modesty. It reflects modesty and chastity. So our sisters, our mothers, our wives, our daughters, our you know, uh, women, they should not be objectified, but they should be respected, they should be honored, right? They should be cherished for the blessings and the talents and the personality and the religiosity that God has given to them. So taking that empowerment of wearing the hijab, our Muslim sisters all over the centuries, they had humongous contributions in the history of humanity. And some of them are the posters up there. As I mentioned, our Muslim sisters, they were the pioneers of universities and hospitals and of pharmacies. They have been gold medal winners like uh, Iftihash Muhammad, right, wearing the hijab. First American Muslim lady wearing the hijab and winning a gold medal in the Olympics. Many scholars, many principals, many teachers, many doctors, right, they wear the hijab and they perform excellently. So hijab is a concept of modesty, is a dress code for humanity. If humanity abides by it, they would be chaste and harmonious and just and society would be the most peaceful of all the societies. That is the concept of hijab. Yeah, question up there. So when you say you have to you pray five times a day, what happens if there's a time where you can't make it to mosque for the, the prayer time? Okay, very good. 
So the question is, I mentioned that Muslims pray five times a day. So what happens if we miss out by, we cannot go to the mosque and pray, what do we do then? So it is recommended, it is encouraged for a Muslim, especially Muslim males, to go to the mosque and pray. It is 27 times more reward if Muslim males can go to the mosque and pray. But suppose if a person is working or on the duty, right, or teaching somewhere or in the hospital, anywhere, we can pray where we are. We can just pray in the office or a nice clean place. So many Muslims, uh, yeah, many Muslims, we just take out break, like especially in the lunch time, we eat the lunch or before the lunch, we just take a break, we pray five, ten minutes, and then we go back and do our activities. Even when we are out traveling, for example, like suppose if I'm traveling from Chicago to like uh, Ohio, right? Me and my family, we just go to the rest area, we perform the ablution, and then we pray our that prayer, so we don't miss it. So prayer is an obligation, we cannot miss it, right? Uh, there are a few exceptions, but we generally we cannot miss the prayer. But one amazing thing about the prayer is the way with that Muslims are praying, every single messenger, every single prophet, they used to pray the same way. So have you seen a Muslim pray? No? Okay, you will get an opportunity at 1.30. So first and foremost, we have to perform the ablution. We have to clean uh, the exposed parts of our body. Our clothes have to be clean, the place have to be clean, right? Our mind, our heart has to be clean. Then we face certain direction. We face the direction of Mecca. In Mecca is the oldest uh, house of worship, of worshipping one God. Alright, so we face the direction uh, and uh, then we start pray. We recite certain passages of the Quran and then we bow down and then we prostrate. Even in the Old Testament, Abraham used to pray a similar way. It says in Genesis chapter 17 verse number 3, when good news came to him, he bowed down the forehead on the ground and he was praying to God. Moses and Aaron, they used to pray a similar way. It says in the book of Numbers chapter 20 verse number 6, they cleaned themselves and they went to pray. Even Jesus, peace be upon him, you know when people were coming after him, he went to the garden of Gethsemane. Over there, he placed his forehead on the ground and he prayed to God saying that, Oh God, Take this cup of death away from me, not my will, but your will. So we say we are following the example of Moses and Abraham and Jesus and uh, Aaron and all the prophets and messengers. We are following the original faith and the rituals that they used to do. That when we are traveling, we can shorten the prayer and we can combine two prayers. Like the second and the third prayer we can combine and the fourth and the fifth prayer we can combine. And even if a person cannot stand up and pray because of old age or some other, you know, physical ailment, they can sit down on the chair and pray. Even if they cannot sit down, they can lay down and they can still pray. So, God has made it easy, but praying is an obligation. You know, just like we ate lunch over here, right? You guys have not eaten lunch, it's waiting for you. Just like we eat certain number of times to nourish our bodies, we pray certain number of times to nourish our soul. It's like recharging our soul, connecting with the Creator. Always be conscious there is a Creator. What is the purpose of life? God is watching. Let's do the good things. So prayer has wonderful ways. It can, uh, it can recalibrate our moral compass, our spiritual compass. So we don't get distracted by so many busy things in our life. Always conscious God is there. Do the right things. Ultimately, we'll be accountable on the day of judgment. So that's the Muslim prayer. When you say Allah is one, who is the actor? Allah who actor? Okay. Uh, is it Akbar Akbar the king or is it it's only one thing, one word? Sure, sure. So when we say Allahu Akbar, we say Allah alone is the greatest. So that's one of the attributes of God is that He is Akbar, He is the greatest. So no one is greater than him and no one is equal to him. He is the greatest in the perfection of being the greatest. That's what we mean. So we don't attach that attribute to any human, any prophet, any saint, any, any part of the creation. That attribute of being the greatest belongs only to the one entity who is God alone in Arabic, Allah. Good question. Inshallah.
Dr. Sadiq, could you please elaborate why Muslim men wear a beard? So we Muslim women wear a hijab, but why do you guys wear a beard? Why do I have it? All right. Why do Muslim wear, men wear the beard? Our officers are wearing the beard, right? Are you guys wearing the beard? You guys are Muslim? No. Okay. Well, a little bit of you. Yeah? Not on Monday. Not on Monday. All right. First and foremost, we, we, we do anything in Islam because Allah is telling us to do it. Our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is encouraging us to do it. So there is a, there is a saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that Muslim men, right? Grow your beard and shave your mustache or trim your mustache. So that is the first and the number one reason we are wearing the beard, means the Muslim male, right? Second reason is we are also following the sunnah or the example of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Means he used to have a beard. Not only him, if you look at any prophet going all the way to the very first prophet, prophet Adam, every single prophet they used to wear the beard. So for that reason, we say we wear the beard and uh, we also look handsome when we wear it. I guess, I'm not sure. So these are the reasons that we wear it, yes. You know, just uh, as a quick footnote, when I was mentioning about Jesus and Moses and competitive religion, there is a sister who is present right here. She was from the Christian background and she was curious about Jesus and Islam. And then she studied Islam of her own choice she did this something amazing. I want to quickly invite her, maybe for 30 seconds to one minute, she can mention about you know what made her to look into Jesus and Islam. Sister, please come on over. Sister Latifa. All right, give her a big hand, Sister Latifa. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam. Um, my real name is Leticia. Um, I chose the, well actually the, my Muslim's name is Latifa was given to me. Can you also hold this please? Yeah. Um, I grew up as a Catholic and uh, I started to get into Islam and the culture and the religion about one year ago. Um, the more I studied, the more the religion makes sense to me. Um, I never really believed in Trinity. I believe that you know we should be worshiping the Creator and not uh, His creations. And it just uh, all my questions that I had were answered um, as soon as uh, I came upon the Quran. Everything made sense to me uh, in this life and the hereafter. Um, last year, I actually did the fasting. Alhamdulillah, um, and it fell on my birthday, April 2nd. So, no cake, no nothing, you know, I did the fasting, I waited until the sunset, and um, I started learning the prayers in Arabic, and uh, inshallah, day by day, I'll be getting better. Um, and also, I remember when my parents sent me to Catholic school once a week, it didn't make sense to me back then, and now it does. Um, I picked up a Bible, and one of the teachers told me, no, not the green one, the red one, and I was like, why, what's the matter with, you know? They have different versions of the Bibles, different, uh, different types, and what I learned about Islam is that the Quran was never touched, it was never changed, and it will never be changed until the last day, because Allah promised that to keep the Quran intact. And um, I just feel more peace ever since I became a revert last month on the 21st. And uh, I'm so thankful to Allah for guiding me uh, to follow the correct path. All right.